G'day everyone. In November 2018, the Queensland branch of the AEVA held the EV Expo at the Brisbane Convention Centre. This uh, displayed a wide range of electric vehicles and had a bunch of presentations from experts in the industry. And this video is just a couple of those experts and what they had to say. If you're interested in coming to the Queensland branch monthly meeting, it's at on the third Wednesday of each month at 7.30 at the Albion Peace Centre. I hope you enjoy the video and I'll see you on the next one. Of course we all think EVs are fantastic, but what does everybody else think? We're very privileged today to have the EV owner survey results and trend. For a 10 minute overview, please welcome Jeremy Webb. And Jake as well. He's a multi-talented guy. If you start selling cars from up here, there'll be trouble. This one? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, yeah, OK. All right. OK, hi. Uh, Jeremy Webb. I'm with QUT, and uh, as you see, we're working on it. But this is a nice joint venture between QUT and UQ. Um, what you, you've heard a lot about uh, what's happening in the world of EVs, but we're now giving you the real information. So what we did was uh, we put out a survey uh, to all the EV associations around Australia and just trying to profile uh, what they were doing. Um, now, as you see, this is done in the context of uh, the explosion of electric vehicles, the, the environmental issues with the greening of the uh, elec uh, electricity grid, and the sharp falling in photovoltaics. So what we're looking at really is, um, in the next 10 years, people are going to have to make some really difficult decisions about how they integrate their home charging systems. They, and what we're saying is, you, you, if you're a Queenslander or a, in New South Wales, it's anything from one third to a quarter of people have solar rooftop, you've got a standalone battery, you've got a, uh, and you've got the grid. So what are you going to do? How are you going to do this? And how are people currently, how are they handling the charging of their cars and how are they mixing it up with these other sources of supply? So the, the aim of the survey uh, was to find out to what extent did the distributed solar and standalone battery would be used to power EVs, to what extent would EVs and residential rooftop solar households continue to be dependent on the grid? And to what extent can EV batteries be used in the economic media for storage uh, for the grid? Now, what, this, this, will be, uh, this presentation is divided into sort of two halves. One is we've done this survey, general survey, and Jake, uh, very luckily, has all these uh, things at his own home. He has a, a plug-in hybrid. Uh, he has a uh, standalone battery, he has rooftop solar. So what I'll present is just a, an overview of what uh, EV owners in Australia in general have, and then Jake will uh, bar drill down into a specific example of how, how a single person with all these things has integrated those systems of supply and demand for electricity in his uh, electric vehicle. So uh, what's happening in Australia right now? Um, a quarter of Australians have the rooftop solar. It's close to a third, I think, in, in, in Queensland. 70% um, expect to have standalone batteries. The survey showing that that's very strong, but not uh, small in number at the moment. Um, now, even now, a number of builders are beginning to integrate these and offer them in uh, housing packages. Um, now the projections are that, again, that rooftop solar will be 30 to 45 per cent of the uh, households if they're up to 50. So we can assume that most uh, electric vehicle holders, owners will have rooftop solar. Um, I won't go through the uh, duck curve again because you've been already tutored in that in the general session. But suffice to say that these are the sorts of considerations you're going to have to work through when you're looking at your various sources of storage and usage. Work. Okay, that's just generally what happens in, uh, in um, Queensland. You can see that the solar produces enormous amounts 
uh, during the day when you're not driving, your, when you're usually not driving your car, uh, you're driving early in the morning or later in the evening, and the wind comes through. Uh, just a quick one. Um, you said something about don't mount all your components on the, the chassis. In mount general, all the engine mounts. Can you um, clarify that? You mean I think like you've seen that the brake vacuum pump and that, that kind of stuff, mount them on the engine although, mounts? Although uh, battery electric vehicles, when they're in, in a large proportion of the vehicle fleet, they still will not overly stress the grid. That, and this, of course, depends on smart charging, and this yeah, is why it's so important to know how and when people will charge. And the, these studies, are, as you see there, show that right, it can okay. be handled. It, it, the studies in America, and there's no, no reason to s assume that they shouldn't be different here, that if you do have smart charging, and that's really because the power stations have enormous excess capacity, and it's built in there to just to meet those high points, the early morning and late evening. And then at, at other times, they have fairly large capacity. So the question is, the problem for us is not whether the grid can handle it, it's how we handle it uh, during the day. Now, indeed, uh, having an electric vehicle can be a positive benefit in the sense that it can be become part of a storage medium. Um, and all I'm saying here is that the projections are that we very large and then cars very rapid and other people have alluded to this. So you've got to start thinking about when you have an EV, it's not just a demand, it's not just pulling energy off the grid, it is there and it, is, it has the potential to become part of the grid storage itself. So, uh, and indeed, um, as it's also alluded to, this may be an income earner as well. Some uh, projections. Okay. So I've already said that this has been a survey of EV owners right through Australia and uh, um, the separate case study will come. So here we get some profiling of, um, of what, uh, from the survey. Uh, it's important to note that m almost all of the people who responded to the survey were BEV, battery electric, fully electric, 15% uh, hybrid, and you see that the 43% are Tesla, very heavily uh, populated, 80% Nissan, 25% Mitsubishi. Um, average driving range, 242 kilometres uh, a week, uh, and an average capacity, battery capacity, 48 kilowatt hours. The uh, average is 46 kilometres a day. Uh, which shows that uh, owners, most, about half, or more than half, the owners had also had an uh, internal combustion engine car, but clearly they, when they buy an electric vehicle, they drive it and they use it as a commuting vehicle, which is indicated there. Um, this is, I think, fascinating. Most owners, over the 70%, indicated that the overall lifetime cost to the EV will be less than a comparable internal combustion engine. So uh, let, let's get this in, in focus. If you're a, a, a Tesla owner, that's about 140,000, 140K, but it's comparing it with a high-end internal combustion engine car. So they are saying that electric vehicles are already economic. Um, I've also just anecdotally seen estimates that, uh, in fact, the actual cost of EVs is already probably equivalent to an internal combustion engine if you had the same volume of production. So we're entering into this era where um, EVs will become the chosen vehicle. Again, I think you may just find this interesting. Uh, we asked them what were the, the major reasons for buying a car. The first one was silent driving experience, which surprised me a little, uh, surprised us a little. Uh, second was performance, and I can, I can believe that. Uh, interestingly, environmental impact uh, was least of the choices. Uh, so people are not buying electric vehicles to lower the world's CO2. Um, 
Again, interesting again, main drawbacks is most important dealer service costs. And uh, I think members of the association have burrowed into this quite a lot, but they are extraordinarily high uh, for a uh, electric vehicle. It's inherently simpler and should be far easier and cheaper to service. So it's an interesting one, that one. Uh, and then perhaps predictably lack of charging stations. Uh, that price comes down below, so interesting results. Um, okay. Look, I, okay. Um, I apologise because there are some important graphs which aren't on here. I, I thought Jake might have had them, but I've just come back from overseas, so we didn't have time to coordinate yeah, terribly well. Um, so here we see that 93% uh, of the EV owners uh, charge um, at home, uh, at home, and predictably at night. So this is where we uh, over. This is where it shows that the standalone batteries are a very important issue here. Uh, if you're going to, uh, uh, if you're going to meet the extra demand which an electric vehicle has, to say on your rooftop solar. I think I'm running out of time here, um, so I might have to work through this fairly quickly. Uh, well, look, uh, what I, I suggest is that we push, push this over. To, we're going to question time. Oh, right, OK. All right, well, I'll have to answer other questions uh, at the, uh, when we get another speaker. I do have copies of the survey and uh, copies of a, a chapter in the book which we've written collectively. So if you're interested more in just do this, I can give you copies of that. OK. Good day everybody, I'm going to try and keep this as short as possible because I know we're a bit behind time. Uh, my name is Patrick Finnegan, I have an accident but I've been in Australia for 20 years. Um, I set up East Station with a couple of, I set up East Station with a couple of mates um, back in 2009. We set up at the same time as Better Place. We took a different view of the market than Better Place did. They front loaded their investments, spent hundreds of millions. We developed, developed a tall strategy because we realised that the demand for electric cars was going to be quite small in Australia in the initial stages. Uh, however, now finally demand is beginning to take off. Why is demand beginning to take off? The reason why demand is beginning to take off is because recently several European countries said they were going to ban the sale of petrol and diesel cars by the mid years 2025 in France, for example, 2030 in Ireland, and 2040 in the UK. And when the UK, the home of Jeremy Clarkson, finally said they were going to ban the sale of petrol and diesel cars, that was a big wake up call for all the rev heads in Australia and suddenly it started to concentrate mines. Now what is going to happen is all the major electric car manufacturers, and I was over in the UK before Christmas and I met quite a few of them, they've all put their uh, development and design teams on electric cars. So in 10 years time, when you go into a dealership in Australia and you want to buy a car, nine out of 10 cars will be electric. And that will happen whether or not we have any incentives or any other government um, programs in Australia. It's gonna happen anyway. So we need to get ready for it. Um, what's going to be the tipping point? Uh, the tipping point is going to be the $30,000 car. This is going to be the people's car. It's a car that most people can afford, and it's a car that will probably do around 300 Ks. So $30,000 and 300 Ks, and that car will probably come in from China, because it's the Chinese who are putting resources into developing that type of car. At the moment, most of the European car manufacturers are putting the resources into developing luxury cars because they're at the right pr price point. Um, like, let's take an example. Um, the, car, car, the companies that are pushing electric cars and that have cars on the road are companies like BMW, and Mercedes, and Jaguar. Other companies like Renault have been fairly slow to push out electric cars. Renault basically have one model. This is a big issue in Renault dealerships at the moment because a 25-year-old who comes in, which is the target market for that particular car, sees the Renault Clio on one side for $25,000 and sees the Renault Zoe for $50,000, and even though they'd love to have a Renault Zoe, they simply can't afford it, and more, important, more importantly, they will not get finance for that car. Now, people are talking about the total cost of ownership of an electric car. If you have an income of fifty dollars or 
you will not get a, a loan for a car that's going to cost you 50000 So it doesn't matter what the total cost of ownership is if you're never going to get the finance in the first place. Um, home charging will be the cheapest form of charging. And people will charge wherever it's cheapest. If a petrol station offers petrol at 5 or 10 cents cheaper than a rival, you'll see queues outside that petrol station straight away, even though the most people will save is about you know, 2 or $3. Dollars. But people have this thing in their mind that they, will, they want to get their fuel at the cheapest price. Home charging will always be the cheapest because, number one, the electricity retailers want to compete with batteries. They'll be introducing cheap overnight rates, so you'll be able to charge at 12 to 15 cents per kilowatt hour. This is already starting to happen um, in Victoria and New South Wales. On top of that, lots of people have battery or solar, so they'll be able to subsidize their charging. And if you're still on the feed-in tariff, you'll probably be able to charge for free. So it's going to be very difficult to compete with home charging, and it's going to be interesting to see how all these fast charging networks that are currently setting up at the moment can compete with home charging. I'd really like to, you know, to see the business case that they have. The other um, form of charging that will be very popular is destination charging. So destination charging occurs when people drive um, on a journey where the, the, the destination point is outside the range radius of their car. So if you have a car that's 300 k's, you're effectively driving 300 k's. You'll probably do that if you're heading to a holiday destination or to see a friend or a campsite or a caravan park. So when you're there, that'll be a perfect opportunity for the owner of the hotel, the guest house, the caravan site, um, to actually sell you power. It'll provide an extra revenue stream uh, for those particular sorts of businesses. Then there'll be, there'll be motorway charging. Now, in my opinion, there'll be limited demand for motorway charging because of the fact that they won't be able to compete on price. In my opinion, home charging and destination charging will undercut the price that can be charged by um, um, motorway service stations. And this is the number one reason why the oil companies have not jumped into the charging station market. At the moment, they can't build a sustainable case for putting in electric vehicle charging stations. Now, my company, East Station, runs the RAC Electric Highway. That's a network of 11 DC fast charging stations in WA. We were, it was free for the first six months. Then we started charging for the power. And then after that, demand dropped off by about 70%. Um, the locals effectively boycott the charging stations because they can charge more cheaply at home. So some of these charging stations are only used seven or eight times a year. So here's an example. Um, this is basically a 200k round trip from Toowoomba to Sydney. So let's just assume somebody's commuting in from Toowoomba to Sydney every day. Um, it's a 210k round trip. If they've got a Jaguar I-Pace um, or a Tesla, they can do that without stopping to recharge. So that means all those charging stations that are on the way in are redundant. Uh, this is somebody traveling from, say, Sydney to Canberra. So let's say it's a politician, a senator, or an MP, and they're traveling on this route quite frequently. They're not going to have to stop to charge, because if they've got a car that does 300k or more, they won't charge until they get to their accommodation in Canberra. Now, there's going to be some winners and losers um, when the electric revolution, when the electric vehicle revolution gets underway. It's not going to be a win-win situation for a lot of people. Um, the oil exploration industry is essentially now a sunset industry. If I was an investor, I would not be putting money into oil exploration. The reason being that half of every barrel of oil is used in fuel. Um, in 10 years' time, that market is just going to drop off a cliff. Um, the, a lot of the fuel distributors will go under simply because they'll lose their market. So the new fuel distributors will be the likes of the electricity distribution companies. Um, a lot of the local service stations will close down simply because of the fact that if you have an electric car and you've got a range of 300k, you never have a need to visit the local service station. You just charge it at home. Um, a lot of the automotive workshops will close because electric cars need very little servicing. Um, a lot of the automotive spare parts um, companies will shut down because uh, electric vehicles need few if any spare parts. Um, so it will be the door queue for some people. Um, we're probably looking at maybe job losses in the range of 750,000 people. Um, you won't be able to retrain all those people. So there will be some people that will be the end of their career. Now, who are the winners going to be? Well, the electric infrastructure providers will be clear winners. So they will effectively be going to fuel distributors. So we're going to have a seismic shift from the oil companies. Do we have any questions? Um, 
the, uh, to the companies that own the electrical infrastructure. In some cases, that's the government. In some cases, that's the private yeah. sector. So they're going to be in a very powerful position. Right. Um, uh, I'm Will wondering, so rates? obviously um, you guys have got to pay yes, rent too. No, I know in some um, is, are you guys have to pay rent too. Account. Is there a fee we for service and how's that work? DC and AC, and we're now starting to install them in large numbers. And the biggest problem that we have is insufficient power at the installation sites. So in a lot of cases, you may require distribution of board upgrades and transformer upgrades. And that costs a lot of money. And that is a major disincentive to putting in charging stations. So in my view, there's going to have to be an MBN type rollout of grid upgrades right across yep. the country if we want to make electric vehicle charging affordable. Has so basically, who's, who's going to benefit? Well, Sparky's because it will require a lot of um, electricians and electronic, our electrical engineers to basically put the charging station infrastructure in. Um, the, electri the electricity retailers, retailers will benefit. People like Synergy, they've got a monopoly in the marketplace. Um, their market's going to explode because the, their average consumer is going to maybe increase their consumption in a house by a third, um, to possibly 50% if they have two electric cars. The average consumption of a house in Perth is 18.1 kilowatt hours per day. Um, at the moment, the reports say that the average car will need 10 kilowatt hours per day to travel. Some people need, need less, some people need more, but the average car needs 10 kilowatt hours per day. So even if we're conservative, if we say we only need five kilowatt hours per day, so I presume that's no going up by about 30, 40 no. percent. If you've got two electric cars, and if you drive around the suburbs in Perth, most, yeah, house, most houses yeah. have got two cars, yeah. well then you're looking at maybe somewhere between eight and 15 or 16 kilowatt hours per day, which effectively doubles the consumption in the house. Um, micro retailing. Um, a new development in Australia since the deregulation of the electricity industry has been micro retailing. This occurs when um, energy procurement companies go out into the market and they buy power at cheap rates and then they sell that to building occupants, i.e. apartment owners or people renting offices in an office building. In some cases, it's a strata management company that actually sells the power. Um, the average consumption of an apartment in Perth is about 2.5 kilowatt hours per day. So if they buy an electric car, they could be using an extra 10 kilowatt hours per day. So effectively, that market is going to increase by a factor of four, and that's a huge, huge opportunity for um, energy procurement companies. Um, that's just the, the stats on, on the market, so we'll just get through that. What we're seeing now is multiple charging stations going in. Um, so we're looking at putting in clusters. Nobody's talking about one or two charging stations anymore. We're past that stage. Now people are starting to electrify the fleets. So we're looking at charging station clusters, that particular development there, that's Wanneroo, city of Wanneroo, they've put in 15, and that's in one car market. Um, again, there'll probably be limited motorway charging. Um, in my opinion, they'll find it difficult to compete with home charging. Um, a lot of people won't bother stopping because they're inconvenienced. There will be, there will be some DC, there will be some high power DC motorway charging. All right, as much as I think people expect. my special guest, Russell Shredder. One requirement we will need is to build that asset. Um, if you install large numbers of charging stations, it won't be possible to have all those char stations charging at, say, 7 kilowatts on single phase connections. We'll have to load balance that, particularly during the day um, when the power availability in the building is going up and down. And we have systems that can do that. Um, one of the things we can do with our system is force people to charge at night. And that is something that we've been already asked about. Um, strata companies and um, corporate bodies have asked us whether they can force tenants to charge at night, so they force them to use the cheap power. And remember, that these stations are located in the common areas, so common area power has to be paid for by the strata, and the strata have to in turn bill the customer. Um, we have billing systems that can do that, so a, a strata manager can decide to use our smartphone app and our credit card and our billing system, or alternatively, they can decide to use um, a billing system that's integrated with their embedded metering network, for example, something like Satec. And our charging stations have meters that can be integrated um, with those billing systems. We'll also need load balancing for homes if you're going to have two cars. Um, again, if you put in two 7 kilowatt charging stations for a private house, the limit's about 14 kilowatts, so straight away you've hit your limit. So if you turn on anything else, you trip the breaker. So you have, you've got a choice then, you can try and persuade the utility to upgrade your power supply, or you can put in a load management system for your home. That's it.